All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Raised Hunting Podcast. And again, we have I have my two special guests here. I have Warren and Easton, and we're going to try to keep them out of the boxing match and uh, move on. But we have a pretty cool topic. But before we get on to our topic today, some of you are going to get a big attaboy, and some of you are going to get scolded. That is, if you watch through Spotify, you guys are doing a good job. Reviews, people have been sharing the the podcast with others. But you people watching through Apple, bad, bad, naughty, naughty. You need to pick it up. <laughs> In trouble. Leave us some yep. reviews, you need, Apple listeners. Need some reviews. So Only if they're good, though. Any Keep specific people we need to bring out today? or No, that's the only thing that's goofy about Spotify and it is that Spotify just lets them leave a review with the stars and Apple lets them, you Comment. know, say something. Yeah. So like if they say anything to us on Spotify, they got to do it through the Q and a section deal that we still can't figure out how to reply to. I can't so figure out how to find on, that on as a listener. Podcast. Find what? The Q and a, I, I listen, I don't listen to like, lots of podcasts, but I've tried to like leave a review and I figured if you click a star, it'd give you like a pop up to talk about or say something and I can't find it anywhere. It will on Spotify. It doesn't. Yeah, well, I can't find it. So you have to like click on the specific podcast to do the Q and A deal. All so. right. Well, today though we're going to specifically talk about whitetail deer and some common thoughts that have been. Well, it's a new study. Yeah, it's a new study. I'm sure a lot of people have probably already heard about it. Yeah, right? there's been a lot of people talking about this new study that came out of Pennsylvania where they collared what was it 1,100 deer? 1,100. Yeah, it says over 1,100 deer. 1,100 deer, and they studied them over the period of 10 years. So yeah. whatever their lifespan was, that's not assuming that 1,100 of them lived 10 years. Oh uh, well, I wonder. Just to, to clarify, and there and and for just to be really clear here and transparent, there's a lot of information, in my opinion, that they're not very clear on. That's going to be yeah, hard for be us to. Yeah, I don't know. Like, were they still collaring deer five years into the study, or did they have they all had, of them collared by that I first? Th- I think that they would have had to continue to <clears throat> collar. Call, uh, yeah, 1,100 seems like that'd be a lot to do it. One time, or maybe that's well, just and it's, they started it. And it would be inconsistent as far as the ones living. Yeah. With so, their average age of a year and a half. But anyways, they found some information through this study that some people would probably agree with and some people would disagree with on certain things and contradict certain things. And um, we fall in both categories, and so we thought it would be a really good topic to discuss on this podcast and see what we do agree with and don't agree with. Well, number one, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to either be really mad about it or just deny it, and uh, I'm going to find that humor. Oh, now these little turds won't let me read it. See, I told you. (laughs) It's really good. Well, the very first comment, I mean, the very first topic that they talk about is deer movement, and I think I tend to agree with them. I've been claiming that... There has been, that it's not quite what we've always thought, you know, that it's first thing in the morning, right at dusk, is your peak movement time. Well, you're going to have a fight here, because this is interesting, because they say in there, was it 12 to 1? Yeah, is that what it says? They had 274 bucks. I would read, but it won't let me read it now. Well, they had 274 bucks that were collared, and they said the peak movement for the bucks was 12 to 1 o'clock, 11 to 1. Which is midday, not over, not in the middle Correct. of the night. Uh, so 11 p.m. to 1, and they're saying that specifically with the bucks mainly, and then the does are uh, evenings and mornings still? Uh, Either well, way, I'm I don't not, know. The study found deer rested in the afternoon, and we're back on the move again from 4 p.m. till dusk. And so I think that that is, uh, number one, I think that that shows right there when bucks are moving. And it depends. But the thing I think to take into consideration with that part is what is movement classified as? Because if How movement, like in, in the evening or in the morning, I know dang well a lot of the deer in certain areas are going from their bed to food. And when they're going from their bed to food, that could be 100 yards. That could be 500 yards. Whatever their routine is that they're going to do. And so I don't know, the, this is where we're talking about the clarify, like they need to clarify a little better. And there probably is an actually very written out study of this that we just haven't found yet. So if you guys know where that's at, let us know. But Yeah, send us a link. Um, we really, I tried pretty I hard think actually it's, to find the full study. It's important to take into consideration at that midday movement, the 11 to 1, 
is more like they're in their bedding area and they're moving around their bedding area or going like maybe a hundred yards this way or meandering that way or checking some different things out or maybe grabbing a bite to eat, whatever. I think that's a completely different type of movement compared to what they're doing. When, when most people think of movement, we're seeing them out in fields, they're moving across fields, they're out and about, not necessarily moving within their own restraints of where they're living. Um, and I don't know if they're clarifying that. I don't know if they're saying that it's the same type of movement or not. But right in, my, in my opinion, I think that uh, I would, I mean, I would tend to agree with it be, just solely because. Uh, well, I think there, I agree with there, what you're saying, though. You have to clarify. So 12, 12 to 1 o'clock, I don't see a lot of bucks standing around out in the field feeding. No, no, that's you know that's the other thing is I think that one we we I would like to know when we're all talking about deer movement I think we're all talking mostly about during hunting season when we're in yeah, our stands right or yeah. hunting deer I that, I re- I think of it I do think of summertime a lot too so just because that's the time when I'm driving around looking at them as well but I'm mainly thinking hunting season or around it well and that's that's really stupid to me that they don't clarify that. Like, is this is this averaged out over the entire year or what? There'd definitely be some skewed numbers if that's the case. Yeah, well, because this is the one, there's part of this on the movement that I do not agree with whatsoever. Um, I think, it, yeah, according to the deer forest study, most deer spent the early hours after dawn in their cozy beds, not moving greatly until 10 a.m. What's more, the peak movement buck was, movement for bucks was between noon and 1 p.m. I, uh... The noon and 1 p.m. might be true. I do not agree with that they're bedded until, for the most part, from dawn till 10 a.m., which the other thing I think we do need to consider here is that this study was on Pennsylvania deer, and that's where I'm wondering, you know, is this, was that over the whole course of a year, or is that, you know, October and November? Because gobbler knob, if that was the case, one, you would never, ever get into that stand and then see anything. And two, you can sit there and see 25, 30 deer from daylight till frickin' 10, 30 that are clearly Coming funneling back. back. Yes. yes. Well, the other thing, according to that, you'd think that you wouldn't be, we don't hunt at night, obviously, but you would think that you wouldn't get much on nighttime, like for trail camera pictures and stuff. And a lot of guys, a lot of people will have more at night than they do during the daytime. Granted, Absolutely that can also be determined whether where you have your camera set up and on their patterns and everything. But with that, how that's going, that would say that they don't move at night, and and that's well, that's just not true. Well, and and the noon to one p.m. That one, I and I, the thing I was saying earlier that I think that you could constitute a lot of this would be cell cams, because I can I can tell you for a fact if there's honestly one of the busiest times on my cell cams, it's probably I'd have to go and look for sure, but I, and maybe it's just because I wake up in the morning and I have a bunch of pictures, but I feel like it's always the morning is when I get the most pictures on my cell cams, period. And I don't think that there's anybody out there that would tell you that they get the most cell cam pictures of bucks at 12 to 1. So is that mean when they're saying that those deer peak movement during that time, is that mean that most bucks are getting up and they're, and they're going 50 yards and then they're bedding back down until that 4 p.m. window they're talking about what does that mean as far as movement to me because if you're going to tell me that a a buck is moving two three hundred yards cell cam i had out last year i i would that i mean that's one out of i don't know how many cameras i had out but one camera that was a cell cam that that one would is opposite of what you're saying right there well, I had a lot of on a rub tree out. too. Like on, they were hitting a rub tree anywhere from like ten to two, the middle of the day, and then I would get some middle of the night. But I wouldn't even get does walking by. I wouldn't get. Um, it was all middle of the day every single time, or middle of the night. You had quite a few there in the morning. Not on that one. Not when I moved it. When I when it was back where Elway was always at. Then yes, that was mornings and well, evenings. Well, like think of that morning. You're gonna tell me that that morning that you almost that Joey could have shot Elway, that those deer weren't very clearly funneling back from a food no, source. No, they were. They weren't I'm, bedded. No, I agree with that. But I'm. You said that nobody would tell you that a cell cam is gonna be. Well, you have one. I have of my seven or eight that I had out this year. There's not yeah, one. Yeah, that's that my been. point. Is that I have one 
there's no variety of right. different ones. The fact that one of one is the opposite of yours would say that there's probably some other people that have the same thing. No, that's a very small sample size. So in fact, and it hit it. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I do. I understand what you're saying. But I guess my I would have better chances of mine being opposite if I had ten or fifteen out, but I had one. No, but you also have to take to, into consideration where yours was. It doesn't matter. Everybody else could have the same thing. That means that other people could be having their cell cams middle of the no, day. I, I had some embedding areas as well, and I would cont- I would tell you 100 percent that I wouldn't even I don't even need to tell you. We could go look, and I would bet you that the the number of buck pictures in the morning or in the afternoon significantly outweighs the ones that we're at. And, and they were they were later in the morning. Like I would, the one I'm thinking of in specific was Magnum. The pictures I'd get of him usually. I, where that camera I'd get on him in his bedding area was not till like eight thirty. Some of them might even been around nine. Well, here here's the thing that you got to take into consideration that you do not do. That there is yeah, that's yours. That's everything that you're hunting wherever your cameras are at. That does not mean that it is not a thing five miles away, a mile away, or somewhere else that somebody else is getting completely opposite or completely different types of deer movement. Well, because then, it's not consistent through every single farm. They're all going to be a little different. Well, then I would say that this study is useless. It, it, you got to take it into relative. It's got to be relative to what your areas are. I, but I'm telling you, like, there's I've parts seen, in that already that relate to me, and you're saying you don't believe at all. And it's not whether you believe it or not. It's whether you, you just you, want to admit you it tell or not. Me, you tell me that you believe that the peak um, buck movement is between 12 and 1. No, I think it depends on where it's at. Because I would tell you right there where where I have a certain spots, yes, hundred percent. Well, that it shouldn't matter. Okay, okay it's but hold on. It does. It does, it does but, depend. But if you don't, how? If you don't take it so literal, meaning you don't say, okay, this. What he's saying is every buck gets up and does this. If you just say, what it does mean is that there is deer up on their feet midday. Well, midday. Yeah, and whether they're only moving a hundred yards or something like that, it's one of those things. Because they talk in here a little bit about rain. They talk about wind. And how it affects the deer and things like that. We, I have my own theories on it, and I don't think that they would. I don't think they touch on that. Yeah. Um. But I, well, guess, I would say that a windy day, you ain't going to find deer moving at all. And but according but to them, that, it doesn't the a, most movement, or it doesn't affect doesn't them. affect them. Yeah. And they say rain doesn't affect them either. And well, that one's one of them is been, depending on the like does don't care bucks do or something. I don't remember which one it was. It'll say that bucks did or uh, bedded down and didn't go anywhere, and does. Didn't have an issue. They seem to be I moving just, still. So I guess my my two cents on this is when you see studies like this, you need every piece of information. Was it on public ground? Sounds like it was. That I mean that this was definitely huntable ground because they talk about rifle season and everything. How were they? How was this study? I know that they were collared and things like that, but what kind of pressure was on these deer? You know yeah. what was going on? That that's also already assuming that we're talking about the same time of year. Because, like, one of the things it says, the study found bucks at the peak of the rut were traveling up to five miles per day. Well, I know for That's a fact. I, gonna... I, I know for a fact we have a deer that didn't travel five miles per day for two years uh, during the peak of the rut. That's, I mean, why doesn't he? But then you he also have a deer that went four and a half miles. Yeah, then, then, so my point is, is that there are so many things. So many things Variance. that can make this. I mean, well, that, the deer themselves, their mentality, yeah. where they live, from state to state, from county to county, from uh, farm. It's farm to farm, farm to farm. Opinion. Yeah, I mean, the other thing you got to take in consideration on that on the the study found bucks at the peak of the rut were traveling up to five miles per day. That does, they didn't constitute. Does that mean five miles from where they typically live or call home, right. or is that just? They were doing loops and, and right, like and on a treadmill. Up five to me, miles. the way went they up, went five miles but never went anywhere. The right, way they you know. worded that to me, I would take that as they just traveled five miles, not necessarily like a distance from here to here, as yeah. in they were up and moving. But and I, maybe but I have five. witnessed the, the nine, the the deer that I didn't shoot come came to the rub tree. I watched him one day that I figured he, that deer had to. I think Nick might have been filming when he came up behind us at um, at midget. Okay, maybe it was Colby, but that buck came up and he was trying to keep the other bucks from getting to the doe that he had there. And he was he had to have put on two or three miles and never went fifty yards. Yeah. He was going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He'd chase him off, chase him off, then he'd run this way. 
and then she'd move a little bit and he'd catch up and then he'd push her back down and into the brush. So he could have someone logging something at the end of the day. If you had a little tracker thing and you came over and looked at the computer, it says number nine went 6.5 miles. Well, in actuality, he went 50 yards. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I mean, I would take this with a grain of salt. I think honestly, we got to roast Lancaster online on this because they provided some information, but they didn't. They didn't give Preface you a link to the full study or anything, um, to where you could actually go and get the rest of this information. Yeah, I haven't been able to find where you can get. I mean, there's one thing it. on here that clicks, in, but it's and it's not any of the, none of the pertinent information or the study. So well, Lancaster Online, you guys need to really up, step up your reporting because it's not very thorough in here well i mean and because we've talked about this this would be so cool to be able to do this especially it sounds like they spent a tremendous they had some sounds they had to have had quite a bit of resources behind them to accomplish this you know i mean how cool would it oh, be to, sure. to tag some or to put collars on deer out here and not even be able to kill them i mean yeah. they're off limits you know just to see what they do yeah. i don't i don't know but I feel like some of the things that were studied maybe weren't completely clear. Well, I feel like it probably is in the study, you know, but they don't they didn't provide any information to be able to find the full study in here. Right. Because this would be really, really interesting information to look at. The other one, it was in there that uh, they said there was no correlation, would be uh, your moon phases. They I, say there that out of... All the peak movements and whenever they were seeing the most deer moving, bucks moving and everything, that uh, they never found any correlation between there being a full moon or a red moon or whatever else may be. They, they was much more random than precisely to a moon phase, which would be very interesting to hear a lot of reactions on that one. Well, I mean, and also the Everybody study. Everybody knows my opinion on the moon. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really have one, to be honest. I don't. I just don't like... The only thing that I will say is on a full moon, I for whatever reason I feel like, and I don't bids my my been lucky or whatever, but I've seen a lot of deer, a lot of bucks in midday on full moons, especially when it's cold. And I don't know why. I'm always trying to remember that I feel like the, a full moon, I, it's daytime movement is awful. Or which one it is. I don't know. I don't remember which one it is. Maybe you ought to start writing that stuff down. I have, and I don't find correlations. Like I, I'll write down the the number one. I want it to be. Well, here's because the, it'd make it a lot easier. Well, here's the number one that I've seen in multiple states, and it, it, it is not. I mean, one of the first deer that I ever killed. It was a spike buck, but it it happened the same way as it did just a couple years ago when we moved here to Iowa, and Mom killed a deer. And I can't think of how many times it's happened to me. And that is right after a rainstorm or a heavy front comes through, I mean, immediate, as soon as you, if you could be in the stand, like during the rain, during the last five minutes of the rain, within minutes, you see unbelievable deer movement. I would agree with that. We've seen that. But I would also, that also depends on how, I mean, if. It just pours for 10 minutes. It's not. Yeah, that's not going to. If it's like been raining for a while, especially if you get storms where it's like off and on raining or just raining days on end, the moment that ends, you're going to be, if you can be in there, you're going to have all sorts of deer all around you probably. I thought this was kind of a funny tidbit. This is an encouraging finding. More than 90% of deer that survive a hunting season will still be out there the following season. <laughs> I just, well, so they don't pack their bags and go somewhere else? Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> I think they're saying that they don't die from natural causes the following year. I I know, but I just that seems to me like... That or whatever other causes. It does, vehicles. like, yes, a, occasionally one seems to get hit by a car or something, but it, it's... Occasionally, that is like the biggest but, industry okay, in the insurance. But at the same time, it was a 10-year study, you would think, if there is any validity to the seven-year cycle of, of um, EHD which I believe that that is the case. Pennsylvania doesn't deal with it like we do out here in the West. They don't see blue tongue, if you want to call it the by the... Yeah, you're going to have a lot of screen arguers here no, that I don't will care. tell you that Bring blue it. tongue and EHD is two different things. Well, well they, they are technically. Technically, technically they are but, different, but I guess what I'm referring to is when... What is it's it? Emphysmatic, e- azunic disease. Eparad, like. epi- epis, Emph- it's like Episodic EMDH hemorrhagic something. disease. Yeah, there you go. 
Okay, and so what it is, it's a midge. It's a small gnat that the they inhale when they're trying to get a drink. They live in the mud, and it has to be in. That's an interesting point. I because thought if that, it that was, was during that bit. ten year study that you're talking about, and you had a, I don't know. We don't know if we can put much weight on the seven year window yet. But let's just say that that's the case. That every seven years you get EHD. That that could possibly completely fudge that ninety percent number. Because sometimes that's, you're losing, I, we've heard 50%, here before, 90%. right when we moved here, yeah, 60, 70, 80% of their deer died. Okay, let me clarify. I thought those it, midges oh, bit, not, not swallowed. They thought, inhale them. But it, either one. Even so if they bite them? I think even if, it could because, and, and I've, I did a bunch of studying on this a few years ago, because the seven-year cycle that we're dealing with here was 2012, 2019, and that would mean that our next cycle would be 2026. 2019 was kind of... Wasn't so bad, and that's because... For us, though, it was for, like, the county over. Yes. Yeah, but that's my point, is that it was it was localized. It wasn't yeah. a, It wasn't the whole state. Okay, so, but but the theory is that that is when the hatch is the, the biggest, sort of like a locust. They come, you know, that's when they're all there. Yeah. If the weather pattern makes Matches it where... Matches up with it. Where it's either so super dry and there's not a lot of places for the midges to live, or the exact opposite, super wet, there's not a lot of places for the midges to live. Then you don't have a really bad EHD c- scenario. Break out. And so what ends up happening is you get by, and then you're good for the next seven years. Hopefully, I would tell you I've been watching this one now very very closely, and so far we're good. We've seen 2020. 21, 22, now we're going into 23, and we have not seen much of an EHD breakout around. We see some. You're always going to have a little bit. What, uh, two things. One, isn't there somewhere where they say that they're now immune to it? Down the south. south. Because they is. get it, because it's it's prevalent all, all the, time. the time. So those deer build up an immunity to it. Where in the Midwest, we, they don't build up an immunity because they're only seeing it every so often. Which, because before the theory was it was dry years was going to cause EHD, right? Correct. Which I think we could uh, say everybody would probably agree that's pretty well debunked because we've had several dry years in a row now. For sure. That's considered drought for where we're for Iowa. Now, but that could mean that it's too dry. And so there's not a lot of places for the midges to live. Because where the midges live for the most part is in like your silt. So Mud. like muddy water mm-hmm. basically. So that's where the other theory came in that Somebody else told you, or I remember we were talking to somebody, and I, and that one made quite a bit of sense to me. They said that sometimes your really wet years can be worse because there's standing water in your bean fields and and more places more places for, the for them to, to be exposed to it. Correct. Yep. So, um, so that's a really interesting thing that that honestly is what we're we're stating here that this all is going to come down to is it for PA guys, it's probably pretty helpful information. For everywhere else, I don't know that this is going to be that relevant to to your area. I think it has potential to be relevant, depending on if they could give us some more in, insight or some more understanding of times of year and times the, like the moon. I would think ton. could be applicable to All deer everywhere because that's that would be a constant. But other than that, everything else pretty much is different. So this is an interesting thing. Um, the movement of GPS collar deer found 43% change their movements because of hunting pressure. And in most cases, they altered their patterns the day before the season opener. They didn't shift their home range, but they moved around less. Also, they exhibited an uncanny ability to hide somewhere in their home range during hunting hours. So that's another one that we were talking about earlier would be really interesting to know is their definition of opening day is that archery season is that rifle season? What it, what would constitute opening day? Forty three percent. That's a big. That's a big number. Well, I mean, but now that that reads a little bit different now that I've read it the third time because it says forty three percent change their movements because of hunting pressure, which that makes sense. And they're getting pressure. And they're the gonna majority move. was the day before. Yeah, but yeah, and it says um, most cases they altered their patterns the day before the season opener. So they they could recognize more traffic. More trucks driving around, guys walking around in the woods. They're picking up on, uh oh, I'm about to deal with what I dealt with last year is happening. If that's so, the case, though, they got to be on it way better than that. What do you mean they got to be on There's it? There's got to be some kind of natural uh, calendar going on because there, there's no way for them to be able to see a consistency until day opener. 
of no, lots I, of more people. I think the day, the week before, you're seeing. You'd How be are they going to know the day before is finally the day, though? If they guys are starting to come in week or two weeks before, just natural progression of the number of encounters they're having with human beings. If a deer is living out there and it doesn't see anyone, it sees someone once a month. Let's just say, yeah. And then all of a sudden, it sees someone two times in this month. Now three times. Then in the next month, they see someone five, six, yeah. seven times. Or now no, that they're makes, up to once a day. That makes sense, but that doesn't that doesn't sound like it was progressive whatsoever. Sound well, like it was. I don't a believe switch they can done. read. I don't think they can read either. But I do know that they can sit there, and when they're going into heat, is dependent on the sun. So I would say that they probably have a pretty good idea of what a year is, going off of pretty seasons close. and times and all sorts of things. That they would have an idea this time of year. Here we go again. Yeah, I don't. I, I do don't. think that. I mean, the uh, the progressive of what you're saying makes the most sense. If they're switching in a day, that progressive doesn't mean nothing. I think is what Dad is saying though is that just the fact that they're all they're saying is their pattern was altered. Yeah, I know. And so he's saying that you get and, he, and how many times right before shotgun season, all of a sudden somebody's walking under your stand and there's people truck, in here trucks driving down the road and guys getting out to take a pee and all this stuff that they and guys stopping on the road and sh- spotlight shining in a field. Yeah. All these things, you you what you see is only a milliscopic yeah. piece of what is go- actually going on. I How did you find this? What Nick? you guys are talking about, though, is Nick just found the study, the, the whole thing. thing. Yeah. How did you find this? So that I can tell people where it is, so, or we'll put it. You know what? We'll put the link in here for everybody <laughs> that wants to go read it. And so I'm going to tell you right now, too. Just looking at this, there's enough information in here that we're probably going to have to do a part two of this. So our part one will have to be an overview of what we're and doing right now. And probably an apology. No, I don't think so from what I'm seeing so far because I think we're pretty accurate as far as a lot of it is going to be super location-based. Yep. Um, and then part two, we'll, do, we'll go into depth on some of this stuff and really, really hammer it out. But we'll put the, we'll put the link in the, in, the, in the podcast here. I don't know how Nick, of all people, found it. Okay. Anyways, my point though was that 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 is assuming that they're the, the guys aren't coming and smoking all their cigarettes or driving around on the roads beforehand. They might do it a, a few guys here and there might be doing it a little bit more, but oh yeah, once it starts, that means that they've got to have at least a day into the season of seeing everybody and be like, "Oh, get out," and change their patterns. Now, if they're progressively starting to see more people, I get it. They're going to start altering already before the season even begins but that doesn't make sense unless they have a, a calendar which is crazy as it sounds i wouldn't be surprised but well the the best <laughs> example that i've seen i'm not talking about a, a physical calendar, calendar ding dong. <laughs> i'm just the, envisioning a deer walking around with between his hoofs well let's see it's got October. three days bill <laughs> yeah I, the only thing i'll say with that the most impressive thing i have ever seen is that deer that we found, the huge four-point antler, too. What you guys have heard us talk about all the time. I called him yep. Hammer. Yep. Uh, he lived on just one very – he didn't live on us. He would come onto our place right. during shotgun season. I had a camera set up where I'd seen him th- – or found a shed. And uh, then I hung a stand for him, and we named it, you know, Hammer Stand. And, and I put a camera there hoping he would show up all season long. And – thinking, you know, I'm so smart, I got hammer stand and hammer camera, and I'm going to find this deer, I'm going to kill this giant deer. Well, he never shows up, never shows up, never shows up, never shows up. November November 29th or November 30th, I get it, I, well, I pulled the camera a few days later um, during shotgun season. But is what happened is he showed up for the very first time, I think it was November 29th or November 30th, it was one of the two. And then there was five days in a row, five days in a row that that deer was on that camera going, crossing the this fence in the same exact place one hour after dark, and he was within three minutes of himself every single time. So that deer was not there, I don't believe. I don't think that he was there the whole time, and I was just missing him on my camera. I think that he no, knew he shotgun there. season was coming. And he moved in. He didn't, but that would say that he didn't know exactly when it was starting. He just knew, hey, it's getting close to that time. And he moved onto us. And then the fact to me that was so crazy was that it was 
you know, the one night it was 607. The next night it was 604. The next night it was 605. Like that he was so consistent on when he would show up and he'd wait an hour. What made you think that you were going to get a chance at him before shotgun season? Because we hadn't paid any attention to that spot where we found his antler. We hadn't paid any attention yeah, to that. No, but so you I knew thought that, that he was coming through in that area. Uh uh-uh. uh. No, this was You're before. saying you found it there and then you went in. This was the and first. And then you had your camera afterwards. When, yeah. When we found his shed, we were totally surprised because we didn't. One. Oh. And so. I thought you were saying you already knew that he was going to be going across there. Uh uh-uh. I was like, well, you already know that you're going to be pushing it. You're going to have like a day time frame there to be able to make it happen. No. So just so people understand what Warren's referring to is our shotgun season starts first week of December. So he had figured out that. What what he, I think you're saying is he hadn't figured out when it started. He didn't know he, it was December 5th. He, he knew it's getting ready to start. Some things have started to change, whether it's the weather, whether it was people starting to come in and put up stands and make whatever. But something triggered him to say, okay, it's time to go to this pattern that puts me in a safe place. Because for the last couple of years, he had been in a place we didn't find him. We did, actually found him on a different camera. Well, you that know, was first. the thing, though, too, is um, we had a camera that was – a few hundred yards away from it, and it was a really strong, really, really good funnel where if he was going that far up, we should have been getting a picture of it. Right. And so is what that was telling me is that that deer was staying in, you know, probably a 300-yard area or less. That meant that he was not he was not 30 minutes away from that camera I was getting pictures of him. He was probably within 200 Five yards minutes. or less. It's yeah. also assuming, though, that you're not missing him anywhere. Yeah, true, but... But That's what I'm saying. Is that pinch idea. point was a pretty good pinch point where, and we had pictures of him there before. So yep. I think if he was going that far up, he, we probably would have got a picture. And so my theory is that that deer, he wasn't even getting up. Like you, your chance of killing him would have been almost impossible because where he was, you couldn't have got in there without him seeing you, hearing you. Like it would have been impossible to get in on him. And then two, he wasn't getting up until dark, or even twenty, thirty minutes after dark, and then he was moving. He was a smart deer. Yeah. That's, really smart. That's why he lived as long as he did. Yeah. The gentleman that finally Well, there's killed others him. that are stupid, but that yeah. one was smart. He was a smart deer. Okay, this is, I think is interesting because I I keep saying this, and now, now like, there's actually some scientific proof to what I've been saying, although I would not have guessed this. So it says, you know, bucks have a core area of about one square mile. What? You're just picking and choosing what you believe from this right. study. You've been debunking it the whole time. Now you're saying it's the right thing. No, I'm just going in order. The study what? also found, I'm going by like paragraph. All right. The study also found deer use physical features on the landscape to mark the boundaries of their home range. Things like streams, roads, pipelines, and power lines. Hunters have the best chance of seeing a deer by setting up somewhere in the middle of their home range rather, rather than these boundary fe- features. That's At crazy. What point to of me. that have you ever said a word about any of that? You ask all our podcast listeners. That's what I say all the time: is that these deer have these zones. Yeah, they have where zones. They, they hit the. No, that's what I've said. Is that you can constitute this? I've, I've heard said, you they, say the zone. They'll hit a certain spot, and for whatever reason, they will not cross that spot. They will not go across it, no matter what. And now there's what they're saying is it's a physical. There's something they physical recognize. feature they recognize that they say, okay, that's beyond my home area my core area and that to me is crazy that they would be so like a rose maybe that so rivers i would think really would be a lot more of a boundary than you might think yeah unless unless, unless that's not part that of the home yeah the core area, I guess. core area we'll have to look at the long version see if they had one that was near a river or something that he was crossing it all the time and i don't think that they're saying that the, i can think of one in particular and that was juice and juice ten, tended not to cross the road west of my house but i do do think that there was one or two times i got a picture of him over there you know so he probably went over there more than once but it wasn't common it wasn't like east side of the farm where he was there all the time yeah i think you could take a pretty big note out of all of this and that being that even with a 10-year study where you're gonna it's a freaking wild animal there's nothing foolproof. yes you're not you're not gonna be able to nail these things down to a t I thought that that was going to give me a lot more insight on things that I could be using, and I don't think it's benefited me whatsoever <laughs> yet. Like, nothing that I have learned or seen that I'm like, oh, ding, that'll help me kill a big deer this year. Well, that's what I'm, I mean, 
just last year we had deer that were, I mean, so when they talk core area, we had deer that had huge core areas. We had deer that had small core areas. We had deer that crossed over core areas from one. We have a deer that showed up in, never seen him before, and he moved in and stayed. Yeah. We have another deer that showed up that ran everyone off. So, I mean, it's just so, there's so many things that go into, that come into play. I don't know how they can determine that either, though, that they can use physical features. I I get zones. Get well, it, 100%. They, well, I would have met, I'm just envisioning that what they're doing is they're plotting this with because they got a collar. Like where they're turning around. And they're seeing they're a river, let's say. Or, and you got a deer that goes over and like this, and he moves around, and he comes back. And then he comes over, and he goes back. And he comes over, and he goes back. And one time out of 365 days or four-year period, he crossed the river four times. You know, yeah. that was it. That that would say that that deer recognized that river was a was a line that he didn't cross. I, I could see where they could make that statement, especially over a ten. If you had a deer that lived four or five years yeah, within that ten year, well, yeah. and who knows? Maybe it's just maybe to us it's a physical feature, but maybe it's an instinctive thing to the deer. You know, I feel like that was just like you'd this think is that as they far just as know I go. that. Yeah, hmm. a, a highway is another one that I would think that would serve a road, especially a busy road. Well, because, like, the one I would tell you is a great example is Toro. Toro, unless you're going to tell me, unless his physical feature was the timber line, that deer would go in the timber all the time over there, but he w- you would never get a picture of him out, up in the field, ever. Yeah. And, it, like, for four years he did that, and I don't know why. Unless, for him, I guess it was like, I don't go any further um, east of this timber. I don't hmm. know. Like, that was, like, that's my physical... That was his physical feature. I won't go cross past this timber because that deer wouldn't do it. I don't know why. You'd think for sure that you'd get a picture of him out in that field. I think it it really comes down to the fact that if if you're hunting all deer, there's not much that's going to help you besides just learning deer and learning your area more than anything or how they're operating on your area. If you're hunting, even if you're hunting specific deer, I'm now I'm thinking about it like. Trying to find the consistencies all the time is dang near impossible. Yes, because the reason I say that is because each deer is different. I, uh, each buck is acting different. And so here's the way I would put it. I don't know how many of you guys play cards. I, I don't play much anymore. I used to play some. But but in uh, poker where you have, they call it a tell, right? When you're playing, it doesn't matter whether I got a better hand than you. Yeah. If I figure out something that tells me when you have a good hand or not, I'm going to I'm going to kill you. Yeah. All right, because you're telling me got a good hand, didn't say anything. Yep. Once in a while, Junior would be one that I would say even though we we weren't the ones that ended up killing him, he he gave up his hand. But, by by coming out that trail so many times, he made the mistake. And that was coming down though to knowing that deer. Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. It doesn't happen very often. Juice would be another one. Juice kind of I mean, we it, and Trail cameras helped us actually hunting and physically seeing him helped us. And then time. I mean, yeah. that's the other thing is if you don't know, like someone going hunting for a week, you're not going to have a chance to to have a deer develop that in five days. You're not going to know that in five or seven days you're or two learn weeks. learn it that quick. No yeah. way. So you're relying on whoever it is that you're going to hunt with, whether it's an outfitter or whether if you're leasing a piece of ground and you go out there, maybe you watch something this year that you apply to next year. That I as weird as it sounds, the biggest things that helped me have been year to year. Yep. Looking back on them. Because even we just found one the other day that we I thought that I mean, I thought I was I'm right with part of it, or partially right. And then I was way wrong on the other part because I have a certain spot that I know that around like there's like a two week period where I'm gonna have some new buck cruising through and it's not gonna be a little deer. Like it's gonna be a pretty pretty good sized deer, if not a freaking big deer. Because I consistently, for years now, it's one of the two weeks that I'll have that happen. And we had it last year, and looking back on it now, we're just looking at trail camera pictures because we're all itching to freaking go hunt again. And we're looking at last year's trail camera pictures, and the deer has been there two years in a row within a week of itself. And so that right there, I never would, I already I already thought that, oh, that was my buck that shows up that's not going to live here. And he went on through whatever. You might see him once again, and that's about it. And you'll never see him ever again. 
And then we went back and figured out that that one specifically, it actually, he's living there a heck of a lot more often than what we ever anticipated. I think we're and just so, off of him a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I think we're on the edge of his zone. Yep. And I think that's uh, that right there, though. I never would have been able to learn any of that if it wasn't year to year. Well, I like would have, Gypsy I would have is a great the same example. Who? Yeah, Gypsy. Gypsy. that buck that we're talking about. Oh, is that what you the, guys The four and a half that mile That goes back one. from his place to our yes. place? He did like, it twice this year. Yeah, that's five mile journey of yep. four and a half miles. But then he stays. So that deer, you know, if you're if you're hunting us, you better kill him before October 15th. Right, or you're, he's you're, taking off. Yep, I'll have him. Your odds are <laughs> out. Or in your case, you it's, better hope we don't kill him before October 15th. Yeah. You know, or he could be, then he's The weird yours. thing is, though, is he... He went four and a half miles for whenever, like, I think it was around October 15th. I think it, it actually yeah, might it be on October. Well, at least we, that's when we first saw him. And then he did go back to you at some point. Not till December or something. No, there was one in between there. Uh-uh. I'm pretty sure because you were checking cameras and KB was on one of them and he was on one of them. But then I had him on another, I had him again. And then you found a shed over there. So he had alternated multiple times. I don't think so. I think we thought that, but we can go look at the truck camera footage or pictures. I'm pretty <laughs> positive because you found the antler over there. I'm, uh, I would have no, anticipated that he would have, after his second trip, I was like, oh, he's. I'll find his antler, and you found his antler on the other farm. That it was. Um, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure because Nick and I saw him. That's what it was. We were hunting. We. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but so that was, he, <laughs> oh, that's what it was. He's following Nick. But that was during. No, <laughs> that was during November. Which I would expect that you know that. I think he's going to be there. The thing I would say about when the zones, you guys film him late December, maybe even January. Um, you you weren't hunting January, were you? Yeah, I was. Yeah, we sure you killed KB. Yeah, like the six or something. Huh. The thing I would tell you about the zones is I think that I think it gives you the best opportunity to kill these deer, honestly, because it, especially even if they're just saying it's a mile, uh, a mile area radius. I think that is is what you can do is when you start now. I think a nomad. That deer. He throws everything out of the book. You're screwed <laughs> with that one. Yeah. He just runs around everywhere. But at the did same he, time. Did he, well, he did. stay for periods, though? Or was he just totally random? Like, would, like was, when he showed up, would he be there for a few days and then he'd leave? Or was he no. just, he was just all over? You might see him two days in a row, you know, but then. But then he was just Next gone. two days he was gone and you were like, just assumed that he wasn't walking in front of a camera, but then I'd happen to see him. He had no problem walking around out in the wide open. Yeah, there's a reason he's dead. Yeah, well. but, but I do. But I, at the same time, I do believe that that deer, um, and again, this is just my theory. This is not a study. I believe he was overloaded with testosterone because of the headgear that he was carrying, and I do believe that I, we felt very, very likely that he was only three years old. Now, someone else killed him, so we didn't get to pull his teeth and check to see how old he was. But, I mean, he had every characteristic, and we had seen him the year before of what he was, and we felt like this deer is three years old. And so I believe that at three years old, they're susceptible to doing things that they shouldn't be doing because they've reached that. They're they're past kind of being bossed around so much now. They're going to definitely get to do some breeding, you know. And and then when you have a rack the size that he did, he could fight for himself, you know. And and I just think that he just threw everything out of the window. Yeah. You know. But the and this this definitely go ahead. Well, there's another deer that we call Cluster, and gone. You know, yeah. But he moves. He moves. There's a difference, and there's a difference in deer that move places. To a new, and then ones that are just traveling Moving all around. over the place. Right. Yeah. So I, because in my opinion, if this whole zone thing is correct, and from what I'm seeing, I think it's absolutely correct for for not all of them, but a large majority. Like if I had a camera on a on a field edge and I'm getting pictures of a deer at night, right? Is what I'm going to start doing, and I think that a lot of people ignore this for whatever reason. I'm putting cameras in the timber. I'm going to start moving in the timber, trying to find scrapes and things like that, because I don't care that much about where he is at night. I care about where he is during the day. And all I'm trying to do is get something that is... backtracking where he's coming from. Yeah, and it's going to take you a little... Like, you're going to have to shotgun affect it a little bit, you know? Because, like, Magnum, Magnum, you do... He had one of these physical features deal where, for what... Before we discovered him, for whatever reason, he did not go past that, that area, like... It was a 200 yard difference between getting pictures of him on a daily basis and never seeing him ever. Yeah. And if you'd have just had a camera on that field edge, you'd have known he was there. 
But then if you'd been moving into that timber, you would need, you'd probably needed four or five cameras it throughout that timber to establish where he is during the day. This 100% goes to my theory of, uh, well, number one, if you do your scouting properly, if you actually scout and you're doing this before all of this happens, you don't have any issue because you were successful with that one. But it, th- what helps is like the amount of information I had on certain deer, I could backtrack like that because I've never been able to do that. I'm like, okay, great i have a cool deer or big deer but it's in the middle of the night what are you supposed to do with that well if you have enough time where you've been out there and you've seen them enough different or different times or different places whatever or you have enough trail cameras out where you're getting them start marking them all and because then what i started doing was i found them i found like loops and stuff where i could literally look and say okay i've got a pretty good idea that okay he's got to be betting over here because he's over here this time, and at night he's over here. And so you can backtrack him a heck of a lot easier. And then again, too, that's where I discovered patterns in the rut that are a thing. That but that's, I 100%. I'll have a lot of people tell me I'm a nutcase for that, but I will 100%. Not all of them are going to do it, but there is certain deer that I had last year that I would have on a three-day pattern. I would know during the rut that they're doing their thing, and unless they somehow get distracted with the doe where they're kind of staying in a small area – I'll give him three days and he'll be back to that same spot checking in and he would do it consistently. This is where I would disagree with you on the scouting thing though. Like Magnum, it wouldn't have mattered because he wasn't there yet. He's doing something different. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these, they're not doing the same. They're not doing what they're going to do from October to end of November until they shed that velvet. You know, they're just a different thing. Like I didn't get the first picture of him until October 2nd and I had cameras out there. I had a couple deer that didn't, didn't. The majority do not. The majority, yeah. once they shed their velvet, or at least for us, it seems to be shed their velvet. You might find another pattern between then and hunting season, but it's not. It's pretty short lived. It's going to vary a little. Yeah, yeah. shed then, their velvet and find my rub tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, game over. Pretty much. I mean, that's been that's not that. Well, that's but you st- you would you're because st- you're subconsciously doing it. You're still making sure that that rub tree is somewhere that they're going to get to during absolutely. the day. Yes. I, don't quote me on this, but the one deer that I did have doing his three day patterns was when I put that rub tree in and he was he would come back to that rub tree within three days every time and he would go to the south and then I would maybe depending get him on a camera that was like four hundred yards away but then two days later hitting the rub again. Like almost to the same time. And I, I it, maybe it was just coincidence that that's when I put the rub tree in that he started doing that. But that one was very that that he, that's the only reason ran or, out of or, those and that was became part of his circuit. While yeah, I was, was going to say, or that's another, that was just something that he wanted to make sure he checked in on was Which, that rub post. Cause he was a big deer. So put the rub tree in, make sure you're hunting the wind. Speaking of that, it had hunt it. your rub tree. And just go hunt. Don't they, be on the couch. That's, that's what we're telling you is we've all said the opposite of each other many times in here. So if you probably had haven't pulled anything from this. But. An interesting fact in here. It said the deer salivate about two gallons a day. Yeah. Oh, that's a boy, lot. Boy, that is a lot. So, so where the heck are they be, drinking all the water? Because I would, I've never. If that's cr- true, then then when you use our uh, our buck junkie, yeah, our buck junkie forehead and salivary gland mix, you probably couldn't put too much on there. Well, I, now <laughs> just because they're salivating, I would not assume that all of that is coming out. No, I would think it'd be pretty dang potent. The yeah, pretty po- pretty the, salivary is not nearly as potent as your forehead. So do not take his advice on that. Don't go dumping out a whole jar of our Damn, buck junkie. off the study. Yeah, and I'm telling you right now, certain bucks have different forehead glands that smell completely now, what more What are you potent. doing? People would be buying if, more. If I was going to say, if we, wanted, if we wanted to sell it to you, we would tell you, <laughs> man, they, they're two gallons, so buy it by the, buy, by the case. But that's not what we're saying. Maybe we're we saying, need to provide a gallon option. Maybe we're doing a bad job of not supplying, not giving them the bottle size they need. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> condone that no. i'm just messing here's one other interesting one before we sign off the study found the average lifespan for a buck is 1.1 to two years most bucks are killed but though it may sometimes seem all have been taken by another hunter many bucks do survive one captured buck in the study survived almost another nine hunting seasons holy cow Mm-hmm. but so their average deer is only making it to one point 1.1 to 2 years old. I'd be curious to know how big that deer got. Because that would show you some genetics there if he really was making it that long. Well, they said that. They said that the um, 
that the key to the yeah what is the key to large racks on bucks? According to the study, it is in this order: age, food, quantity, and quality, and genetics. So food, genetics quantity, is last. and quality, and genetics. So they're saying supposedly. age is number one. Age is number one, and I would say that here so, in Iowa, I think that our average lifespan of a deer is um, not two years old. I think probably three. Yeah, I but, think so. Well, I'm just trying to figure out if you put age at the forefront. That's saying the longer they live, the bigger they'll get. I think they're just saying that they got to get to four, five, six years old. I don't yeah, think they're right. saying that. I don't. We think need that. to get a hold of these people because we have lots of questions. Yeah. So if we got lucky and any of you writers or college students or whoever did the study uh, are listening, give us, give us a ring because we Warren will – We'll Probably not them. apologize for being rude, but I would like to ask you questions. So. Yeah, I didn't roast them. I roasted Lancaster online. Well, which was it's the the whoever people. they're with, probably. No, it's just the people that published parts of it. Yeah, hi, Chris Do. Well, I think it's... We do. Oh, I wait. Think, uh-oh. We almost forgot a section. Oh, Lord. My uh, random fact. Oh, oh Lord. man. So, and maybe we <laughs> should all raise a toast to this study for us signing off. Do you know why it's called Raise a Toast? Raise a Toast. Yeah. I don't. No way you know this. Yeah, the Romans used to put spiced toast in their punch bowls. Holy crap, you got it. Well, so why Nick does that just make got any it. sense? I don't get it. So the Only reason th- that we all say Raise a Toast is because the ancient Romans used to take, it was burnt toast. They would put burnt toast in their wine. I guess it offset the how bad the flavor was or something. And then they would all, you know, have and a toast. Chug. And so they would say, raise a toast. Yeah, and that's and then they would I'm all chug their lie. wine. I'm not going to lie. I just learned the saying right there because I've never said raise a toast. I've well, always raise said. Raise your glass and toast. I'd say yeah. raise your glass or let's have a toast, not raise your toast. Okay, well, I've never have. thought that. <laughs> I've said it wrong for I don't know how long if that's the case. Yeah. And you're going to trust him with your deer science that he's passing on. I don't have the science. I'm saying it's variance. All right? Okay. Whatever. And I think that was definitely a random fact that we didn't, didn't need. need. It's just one of those things that yeah, just Yeah, you did. Now you'll know every time you have a toast that it was from the ancient Romans, and it's the offset. And maybe if your dinner sucks, you'll know, we'll just need to re- put, it, put it in your wine. Put it, yeah, that's the opposite of me. Yeah, if I had a bad dinner, I would not be raising a toast. I wonder which one of them decided that. You know Put what? It in My there. toast is burnt. Better stick it in the wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. It's soggy bread, man. Well, All right. Well, guys, I don't know if we've helped or hurt or just because we kind of pulled that apart. Um, the yeah, Lancaster like Online. Deer, I don't think that we really we passed on or I tried to pass on a few things that I think that were uh, things that we've seen. For instance, the HD, the after a storm. Um, there's probably more that we could pass on, but ours are theories, the things we've seen while hunting. Yep. And I think a lot of that's what's based on um, I, the, the next time that you go hunting and there's a full moon, you kill your biggest deer, you're probably going to believe that big deer move on full moons. You know, and you're you're right, they do. They move on full moons, they move on no moon, they move on everything in between. But there is some correlation to some of this on what's happening more often I, this study, we just don't have enough information to really nail down and say yes or no. So, yes, I agree with these guys. If someone's got some information and would be willing to come on the podcast, we'll bring you on and ask some questions and see if we can get to the bottom of it. But Primarily f- geared towards that study because I'd like to ask more questions about it. But Maybe right. we should try to do our own and call her deer. Yeah, let's just... All right, the so only thing we're going to raise a that, toast and get on out of here. We should do everybody else's deer because... Then we'll the, we'll have like a two twenty and we can't go shoot him because he's on because he's wearing a collar. GPS. All right. Thanks Cheers for watching, to that. guys. We'll see you next time. <laughs> you guys are goofy. <laughs> <laughs>